Hello, everybody. So my name is Paul Gilbert. I'm president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation, and this is part of our Creating a Compassionate World series. And it's a great privilege and an honor to talk to somebody I've known for many years, Jasvenda Sankara. These are all books really around the key themes of, of shame and shame in certain communities. So let me tell you a little bit about Jasvinda, and we'll talk about how we met many years ago when we get going. But um, um, she was born and brought up in Derby, a survivor of a forced marriage. She is the founder of Kana Nirvana, a national award-winning charity that supports both men and women affected by honor-based abuse and forced marriages. She is a highly acclaimed international speaker and an expert advisor to the courts in matters of child, civil, and criminal proceeding, proceedings as a chair of domestic homicide reviews and was instrumental in ensuring that all UK police forces are required to improve their understanding of honor-based abuse and forced marriage by inspections conducted by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary. Her memoir, Shame, was a Times top 10 bestseller and described in the House of Lords as a political weapon. Jasvinda is recognized as bringing the issue of forced marriage into the public domain, and Prime Minister David Cameron stated that her work turned my head on the issue of forced marriage. Her work is recognized as being pivotal, pivotal to the creation of a specific UK forced marriage criminal offense in 2014. Her successful claim of sexual harassment against a peer in the House of Lords was the first in its history and has already led to an increase in reporting and resulted in significant changes in the House of Lords policy and practice, including greater debates and reforms resulting in a House of Lords independent inquiry into sexual harassment and abuse. Well, not only that, but she has received many and numerous awards. I'll just read a few of them for you. Uh, Woman of the Year in 2007, Honorary Doctorate at the University of Derby in 2008, Pride of Britain Award 2009, Cosmopolitan uh, Ultimate Woman of the Year 2010, listed in The Guardian's Top 100 Most Inspirational Women in the World in 2011, in 2012 received the Global Punjabi Award, awarded Commander of the Order of the British Empire, that's CBE, in 2013 in recognition of her outstanding contribution for the victims of forced marriage and honor-based abuse. 2014 was awarded League of Campaigner of the Year, entry in the 2016 edition of the Book of Who's 2016 International Women Award for Human Rights, from the Italian media. There we are. Uh, in 2018, she was awarded an honorary doctor of law by De, Mont um, De Montford University of Leicester, Women, Woman of the Year by Leeds City Council, and also an entry in the Voices and Vote book celebrating 100 years of women's voting rights. She was commissioned by backing, it was commissioned by Buckingham Palace as one of a hundred women deemed to have made the most significant contribution to women's rights. In 2019, she was awarded the Robert Burns Humanitarian of the Year Award and also the Sikh Women Substance Award. In 2024, Jasvinda was awarded the WIM Women in Management Top 50 Professional and Career Women Awards in the category of social activism. And this morning, she told me the most remarkable and wonderful news that she's been made a dame uh, and she's going to accept her honor from Buckingham Palace at some point. So that's an incredible uh, achievement. I mean, just amazing what you've been up to. We met, I think, back in 2000 and 2000, something like that, when you were doing work on shame and Carla Nevada. So how did you get into shame? Because we see what you're doing the addressing of shame the healing of shame and the preventing of shame is probably one of the most important compassion things we can do because shame causes so much suffering mm -hmm. and our preparedness to do things out of shame uh, harmful things out of shame is a source of great suffering so your work is a great inspiration to many of us including me but uh, let's go back to the beginning so how did um <laughs> how did we first meet over shame well, um, I 
I'm from Derby. I was born in Derby. <laughs> the, you know, my, my father came to the UK in the late 1950s in search of work from Punjab in India, settled in Derby, and I'm one of seven sisters, and we were all raised in, in Derby, basically. And um, one of the things that happened within my um, childhood was the fact that our parents taught us this concept, shame, and how fundamental it was to how we behaved and didn't behave. So it really formed our ideas around behavior and the do's and the don'ts, especially of what was expected of a, a young girl who's going to become this young woman and who in the future is going to become somebody's wife. I learned that very quickly as a young age. And certainly I, as I got older into my adolescent years, I understood that young women carried the, I, I will call it the burden of shame because of how it controlled our behaviors. So, you know, female sexuality was very much invested in us in terms of the power to dishonor and honor a family through what we learned to be shaming behavior. So the concept shame, the word shame, as it translates in, in for Urdu and Punjabi is is it? And, you know, it affected what I was able to do. So, for example, um, I was not allowed to integrate. So, you know, you stick to your own. You don't integrate with the broader British community. That was deemed shameful. You don't wear makeup. You don't um, go out with boys. You don't um, have independence and freedom. In fact, um, being educated was deemed a shameful thing. My mother used to say to me, I only send you to school because it's the law. So the point I'm making is it's this, this word was something that was instilled in me from a young age to the point where I understood that I had the power to bring shame on my family. And that was a bad thing. You know, it was a, a shameful thing. So I watched my sisters leaving home one by one to marry men in photographs. You know, they disappeared from school at the age of 15. When it was my turn, my mother sat me down at the age of 14 and presented me with a photograph of a man I was to learn I was promised to from the age of eight. And saying no was not an option. In fact, what my mother was very clear about was you do not shame this family and say no, you will have to marry this man. It's a promise, you know, and a promise of marriage is an honourable thing. But I did say no. And um, subsequently, I was taken out of education at the age of 15 and a half, held a prisoner in my own home until I agreed to the marriage, which I did to plan my escape. And I ran away from home at the age of 16. And the story really starts there, I suppose, because on that day and when I ran away to Newcastle up north from Derby, I could never imagine the response from my family, which was basically you either come home and marry who we say or from this day forward, you are deemed dead in our eyes because what I had done was deemed so shameful. And I was deemed as somebody, and still am actually, but I, I, 43 years down the line, my family refused to talk to me and acknowledge me because in their eyes, I'm deemed this shameful person who has done this to her family. And really that was what led to the creation of the charity in Derby, that is Carmen Nirvana, you know, a charity that gives voice to the victims, both male and female, um, of honour-based abuse, forced marriage, child marriages, female genital mutilation. These victims have been harmed and are being harmed today because the family deem any assertion, any ability to stand up to the family for basic things as as shameful and they they are thrown out onto uh, the margins they're treated as um, they're ostracized they're treated as being shameful and actually that was how we met paul i i i couldn't um hear these women without hearing them echo my own experience that they themselves felt that they were shameful beings and self-loathing and the feeling of self-loathing because of this and not being worthy enough was so central to how they were feeling. And in fact, you know, the issue of mental health kept on coming up. And when we think about the impact of that, 
in terms of depression, um, self-loathing. We don't even have a word in Punjabi and Urdu for depression. Um, I came to you, to your research centre in Derby and I, and I said, look, can you help? You know, we, we need some research in this space because people need to understand the experiences of this community are very different. Sorry, that's a long-winded way of explaining it. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to start at the beginning. <laughs> that's a brilliant way. And of course, incredible, incredible courage to do what you did. I mean, that's just a quite extraordinary. <laughs> But your courage shines all the way through all of the things that I've been talking about. So the, that's right. We met with Shane because we had a big research on Shane because, you know, my area was depression then shame and uh, shame and is a ma major part of that. And as you say, uh, you can have shame from the outside. And what was very interesting when we did our work together is what we called reflected shame, that you can bring shame to your family and they can bring shame to you. That that shame through social relationship. But then there's the process of being shamed and there's also the process of how we internalize it and we become self-critical and shamed of ourselves and you know in the feminist literature it's called the silencing of self women yeah. silence themselves silence their desires silence their preferences silence their values and that was a that was quite a major uh, process that you guided us through and then we you invited us to come and do some research with the 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 communities and Izzard hadn't I'd never heard of the word Izzard until you talked to us about that process of shame very much as a social regulating process the ways in which you subordinate other people to the will of the 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 culture or whatever it was yeah so that was extraordinary and um out of that we had all kinds of insights into how people were thinking about Izzard and the power of Izzard the, the shame yeah. others um so that was quite extraordinary and i remember in one part of it where people were asked we asked some of the older women you know what should somebody do if they were being physically abused by their husbands and rather than leave them they said be better just to kill yourself than to actually leave them because leaving them would be so shameful and that was quite extraordinary i mean so you really opened our eyes to the power of shame within culture mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the reasons why Karl Lamana was founded was because of my own sister, Rubina, who was taken out of education to marry this stranger. My sister had a horrific marriage. And as with my other sisters, the family's response was always the same. You know, it is a woman's role to uphold the honour of the family, do not shame the family and go back to the abuser. In the end, my sister set herself on fire, Rubina, and she committed suicide and died. And I never forget, um, you know, I was on, I was ostracized at that point, but I still went to the funeral and hearing the voices, not only of my family, but the community saying how it was better for her to take her life than for her to shame her family and leave an abusive husband. I mean, fundamentally for me, that day was a turning point because one of the things that happened to me when I left at 16 was I'd internalized the guilt of shame so much that I believed that I was the perpetrator, that I, I absolutely did not own being a victim. I believed I had done this to my family, that I was bad, you know. And, and remember when you're one of seven sisters, you know, they've all followed that path. I was the only one that didn't. I was being made to feel that I had shamed them and not worthy you know I remember my mother saying to me on the phone when I rang and begged her to let me come back home but I didn't want to marry a stranger and her saying you know I hope you give birth to a daughter who does to you what you have done to me then you'll know what it feels like to raise a prostitute because she was so she was so ven venomous at me asserting myself and it being so shameful that one of the things I've had to learn, and I think it only happened when I started campaigning, was that actually I hadn't done anything wrong. You know, I wasn't a perpetrator. I wasn't this shameful being that you made me believe I was. But but then I understand myself more in that when you're raised within a family dynamic, you, you know, your parents teach you your right and your wrongs. You know, so I had all these skewed ideas you know and actually today as I stand here sit here should I say I have a lot more empathy for my parents I really do I um 
I understand their, their role within it, which for many years I was angry about. But today I have no anger whatsoever. I have nothing but empathy because, you know, my mother and father were doing what they thought was best. I'm not condoning this. They were doing what they thought was best. But equally, their journeys were such whereby if they had accepted me back, then the family and the community would have disowned them. You know, it, it, shame is also about keeping face. You know, it's this having to look in the eyes of others and behave in that way where others will accept you. And that was too much of a price for them to pay. And I, I, I understand that now. Doesn't make it right. <laughs> but it is <laughs> extraordinary. And I mean, it has a lot of implications for what we call attachment theory. Because in attachment theory, you know, you form attachments and so on and so on. But shame is a way that seems to turn that on its head, where parents are prepared to be quite harmful to their children. I mean, you know, the you know Chinese foot binding, where young girls had their feet smashed. Mm -hmm. You know, that went on for nearly a thousand years, and that was all shame. You know, it's female circumcision, all shame based. It's maintained through shame. So shame seems to override uh, 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 the more empathic connectedness or the desire to stay connected with your, your with your children or your family or your culture so it is such a powerful force that it can do that um uh, uh, how do you think you sort of were able to find the courage to sort of stand up against that i think the first thing for me was that i had to accept that it was wrong you know, I had to literally unlearn all the things I believed to be true, that I had a responsibility to this concept called shame, that I had to not do basic things because it was wrong. So, you know, the kind of unlearning of it's okay to be educated. You know, it is okay to wear makeup. It's okay to date. It's okay to do these things. I have to say, it felt like I was on a holiday when I first left home because, you know, I'd been a prisoner in this world and all of a sudden everything, I didn't have to behave in that way according to this concept, which I was made to believe was all you, all you had to do. So I had to unlearn all those things and accept and turn things almost on its head and learn from start again. And the, the biggest thing for me was because my family disowned me and I was carrying the guilt and the weight of not having my family. I mean, I live in Derby and they'd cross the road and ignore me. And, and not just that, you know, my children had missed out on, on their mother's side. It's a total blank. You know, they have no family on their mother's side because not only was I deemed shameful, but these were the children of a shameful mother. So they disowned them too. And my grandchildren. So. I had to start to learn, unlearn and learn that it was acceptable to be born here in the UK, to be educated, to integrate, to do the basic things people take for granted every single day. I don't take my independence for granted sitting here. You know, I had to fight for that. And then I had to start to remove all expectations of my family because that is incredibly painful, you know, the expectations you have of how a mother's meant to behave or a father or a brother or a sister. Um, so I had to learn to live my life, and I still do, um, without family. You know, I, I don't know who's alive and who, who isn't. Mm. But the pain of going there, I actually learned two years ago, my brother had died. It was on Facebook, you know. So learning to remove the attachments as it were, of the expectations of family has been a coping mechanism. And I think one of the biggest things is you have to forgive. You know, you have to let go. I have to have more understanding, more about my parents, as opposed to those who are born in this country who are still doing the same thing to their children. You know, my parents' generation, my mother was married at a very young age, you know, she was raised fundamentally as first generation. And and letting go and forgiving them and being compassionate towards what they were going through, having that empathy 
has has really helped me considerably in terms of understanding for myself. Yeah, so I think that's a really extremely important point. That, that this, it's a long journey, though, isn't it? The journey oh, to, yeah. to forgiveness is a long journey. I mean, the key I think you're making very clear, which I think is very important for all of us, particularly those who work in mental health, is that culture and relationships trump everything, right? And at the root of so much depression is the sense of loneliness and disconnection. I'm not good enough. I'm not wanted. I'm this, I'm that. So that sense of you know self-criticism and shame is ripples all the way through. But what you're telling us, I think, very importantly, very powerfully, is that shame is a uh, it's it's a culture. This culture of shame is very distorting of our true nature because our true nature is to be caring and compassionate for the most part. But we can distort it with shame, and shame is a massive distorter of compassion and it would as you say it breaks up families parents turn against the children and even kill their children uh, because of shame so you. it is such a powerful process and therefore listening to your story about how you were able to confront that because basically you've brought immense compassion into the world with all that you've done all the things that i read out earlier of addressing shame and saying no to shame but it's taken immense courage for you to do that and i'm just thinking you know if people are listening to this if they want to sort of follow in your footsteps, as it were, what are the sort of things that you've had to really deal with? What are the pains that you've had to work through? Accepting the differences between myself and my family. You know, this, you know, when when we have to agree to disagree, that's the term, is it not? That accepting that they are never going to change, <laughs> you know, you know, craving their love, um, craving some semblance of, please notice me, <laughs> you know, um, you know, even giving birth and then hoping that would change things, you know, graduating, hoping that would change things, trying to be a better version of myself in order to, to be accepted. And, that, and I've spent many years doing that, so I'll be quite frank about that but then actually no longer having that expectation, learning to um, accept myself, I am good enough, you know, um, I am worthy, uh, I am capable, you know, um, don't believe what they say, you know, learning that my foundation was rooted in a lot of lies actually, you know, women are not meant to be educated, you know, your role is second to that of a man. These things have to remember, if you're raised in that culture, become part of your DNA. So unlearning them is really important. And that is why when I was campaigning, and campaigning has been part of it, Carmen Nirvana became a, my salvation in a way, you know, in terms of putting all that pain into this charity and advocating. I would be absolutely vehement with professionals and saying, Stop telling me, is it part of my culture? You know, abuse is abuse. You know, treating people less than they deserve is not religion, it's not tradition, it's not culture. So this term I coined, cultural acceptance, does not mean accepting the unacceptable because if professionals are thinking in that way or too afraid to go there for fear of treading on cultural toes, then they're also part of the problem, you know? so. So it was important, that became important for me. The strategy, I suppose, of when I gave birth to my first child, I mean, I have three children and three grandchildren. Legacy is important, Paul, because they will never have to inherit that legacy of abuse because of the choice I made at the age of 16. You know, intergenerationally, shame passes on, this concept of shame, and then you're doing it to your kids and future generations. They won't have to. And for me, that gives me immense relief as a parent and, and pride. You know, my daughter, Natasha, married 11 years ago. She had the big fat Indian wedding and we had 300 guests. You know, not one member of my family was there, which, which was quite painful. And she checked and checking in with mum, making sure mum was OK. But she had that day because of the decision I made when I was 16. 
Now I'm not you're not thinking that as a 16 year old when you're making the big decisions, but looking back, I would say to anybody, please remember that your choices ultimately impact on your children in the future and you can prevent them from inheriting these these legacies of abuse. They're independent, they're educated, they're free. <laughs> they marry or not, it's up to them. And also they see their mother as being honourable. I say now, you know, in my mind, my honour is their shame. Yeah. I no longer live my life according to what people think of me. Yeah. We were raised to believe you behaved according to what the community might say or what the neighbor, back in the day, what the neighbours might be thinking. But it was so fundamental to keep up appearances. It was so fundamental to the family and shaming behaviours yeah. that, you know, I don't no longer live my life according to what other people think. As long as my I can go to bed at night, my conscience is clear. I'm OK with that. Yes, because from from my point of view as a compassion person, what seems to shine through through you all the time is that you're living to compassionate values, not to cause suffering, to address suffering, not to be a source of suffering, to be a source of freedom, to be a source of growth, to be a source of flourishing for people to find their own way and so on. Uh, can I take you back one point though, which I think is a very important point, which is the difference between understanding the cultural power of something and the acceptance of it because it is cultural. And I think that you put your finger on something very important that when people think of the cultural power of something like shame, they feel that it's off off limits, then they can't sort of engage with it because what well, you know that they're outside of it, or whatever. But the point that you're making is that abuse is abuse is abuse, whether it's cultural, whether it's not, it doesn't matter. You know, if you hold to the principles of that individual being not subjected to suffering by another human being that's the principle and it doesn't matter whether there's a cultural push against that or not that's a key principle of human rights um so I, I, that's a such an important point to get across isn't it that culture is powerful but it doesn't mean to say we have to accept it no absolutely and there are some wonderful things about my culture yeah, yeah. you know i've learned to embrace without the pain Sorry, that's my dog in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the most compassionate being? He's, he's listening intently, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I am not, you know, it was Gandhi who said, um, we would, we women are going to drown in a sea of oppression in the name of tradition. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we, we were taught that these beliefs and values were rooted in this concept called religion, tradition, and culture. When I was a young person, it's difficult to challenge that. When I when I left and I did, ended up going to university, the only one that graduated in the family, by the way, I did my dissertation on women's Sikhism, and I, and I saw how wonderful Sikhism was, founded, you know, in the fifteenth century, in the belief of equality. You know, women are called core and surname, given the core surname, core and sing, because what the teaching was, was we have to abolish the caste system. Men and women are equal. You know, what is written is, we know across all religions, without getting into religious debates, what is practiced sometimes can be a different thing. But the point here is, it's when that is used to cause harm That's and make us right. believe. So I've had to, you know, remove myself from all of that. And I have to say, you know, in my time, there was no support or understanding. What I would say to anybody is, you know, I was taught to be silent. You know, it was deemed shameful to speak outside the family. And I've had to learn that speaking therapy is, is not, you know, shameful. <laughs> you know, your strategy in terms of speaking and speaking to people in confidence or speaking out is healthy, actually, very healthy. And in today's world, there is far more support available in this space than when I first left. And I would, you know, um, really urge people to think about that. Yes, it's brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. And the point that you're saying, I think it was also to come back to this whole issue about, you know, how all of us, um, whether we're in the culture or not in the culture, can keep coming back to this basic principle because, you know, the compassion principle, 
which is to live to be helpful, not harmful, and mm -hmm. to try to release all sentient beings from suffering. So that basic principle overrides shame, overrides everything if you listen, if you live to it. But yeah. as you point out, you sometimes you have to be prepared to take on quite a lot of rejection and persecution to live to that principle, because you know there are vested interests to try to make you uh, comply to their value systems. And I mean, you know, we're also looking at male shame. And one of the problems with male shame is that they're not vulnerable. They have to do all this aggressive, horrible stuff. And the world has yeah. been really uh, destroyed by aggressive male leaders. I mean, you know, on and on and on and on. For the empire after empire after empire, aggressive males, really aggressive males have caused so much damage. And of course, these guys, when you get into them, they're all traumatized guys. They carry a lot of shame, but they mm -hmm. exp they 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 deal with it by dominating and harming other people. So the issue of shame on both sides is such an important thing. It's the those that are subordinated by it and those that are empowered by shame and the ability to shame. So I think all, how we address the shame from a compassion point of view is really quite crucial. Your point that you make about working through an empathic understanding that in a way we like to think of ourselves as these independent free thinking people but we're not we're culturally created you know the values we have are culturally created if we were we'd been born in the time of the romans you know 2000 years ago 30 percent of romans were slaves most of them were sexual slaves we'd go to the roman games we'd be quite happy to do that we'd be quite happy accepting people being crucified for crime so culture has such a profound impact on the values that we accept. So the key thing now for us, as you know, is how do we spread compassion values? How do we help people really adapt, adopt the values and, and support the values that you are fighting for and have fought for and have quite rightly been recognized for? How can we help people really support standing up against shaming practices that are harmful? Oh, well, it takes moral courage. Moral courage. <laughs> we know that. We know that. The less we talk about shame, the more control it has over our lives. Yeah, yeah. And the more likely people are to you know, get away with it. So from my perspective, you know, it, one of the things that I've tried to be true to is tr true to myself. If something is wrong, speak out, you know, and I've, I've done that in all my it walks wherever I've gone in different roles I've played a wrong is a wrong you, you cannot defend a wrong and you know and and I'm talking about you know local authority in terms of I remember being on the um I was the independent safeguarding chair for the lead safeguarding partnership and one of my fundamental roles was to oversee child protection systems to make sure they're effective and they're working I remember a case and this case came to me, and I'm talking two years ago, this case came to me. And um, this was a young girl who had been placed with a registered sex offender by the authority of the court. And this young girl had gone to the do doctors with this man. And um, basically he said she'd been sleeping around, got herself pregnant. But the doctor, thankfully, looked on the screen, asked the man to leave, did the right thing and spoke to the girl on her own. Turned out this man had been abusing her. She was actually pregnant. To cut a very long story short, the man was prosecuted, the thesis was tested. This girl's now got to start rebuilding her whole life as a 13-year-old. But I was amongst professionals who did not see this as serious harm. You know, because we assess it, we do reviews. They didn't want to review. A review would mean looking at the whole case from scratch. What went wrong? What didn't people do? What can we learn, etc. And that was being prevented. So you become the person who is rocking the boat, as it were. I mean, you know, for good. You know, this is wrong. Morally, this is not right. We need to look at this. And that requires courage to have that conversation. Some people just don't want to do the right thing. Some people just carry on doing it right, done that. Let's push that to one side. Let's not have that conversation. Let's hide it, you know, and move on. Well, thankfully, you know, um, I, 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 and also I have to say in that space, you can become um, intimidated by people. 
because people will use all sorts of tactics to bully you, to they collude, they'll gang up on you. But I have to say, I was I'm used to that from my foundation growing up, you know. So, you know, the kind of strategy is if you walk a straight line and let's have this conversation, you know, what is the fear here? Well, the fear is from their perspective, reputation. Yeah. So they're frightened of their own shame. They're frightened of being there you go. There you go. That's there you the go. thing, isn't it? And then and it goes they... on and on and on and on. That's right. And that partly links to the the fear of the persecuting society, you know, we have to be able to deal. People want to persecute. When you find error, we got those. That's not a way of dealing with errors. Dealing with errors, we need yeah. to be much more open and much more prepared to say that was wrong. I made a mistake there. How can I correct it? And so on and so on. So facilitating an open culture, as opposed to a closed, defensive, persecuting you if you've done something wrong. Absolutely. So I think that's a really important point you're making particularly with professionals, because they you get a lot of defensive caring in professionals. So they're always, you know, where's the next hit coming from sort of thing. Um, so that's a very important point. And that means creating supportive cultures and supportive groups. I mean, you know, all the work on the whistleblowers in an EHS. I mean, they yeah. got hammered. Yeah, absolutely. It shouldn't, that shouldn't happen, right? You, you, you support your whistleblowers. They, they are the canaries in the, in, the, in the cage, right, in the coma. Uh so it's all about shutting down shutting down shutting down so coming back to the question then in your approach which you've done and done brilliantly is opening up opening up opening up so that we begin to see whether it's a culture that's causing harm whether it's uh, the professionals that won't address their own shame or fear of being challenged or whatever it is it's all about how do we open up to this threat of rejection or threat of being criticized and yeah. Yeah. and then, uh, to hold that sense of self i think absolutely uh, and shame is it, it creates the very part of us actually um that believes we are capable of change yeah. because, because ultimately you know i mean this is in the public domain i'll share it with you paul um last year i was sacked by the church of england you know i was the on the board with other people uh, my colleague Steve Reeves and my role was survivor advocate so for a whole 18 months my role was to engage with survivors that had been abused by members of the clergy you are talking about men and women who had been um, sexually abused physically abused mentally abused we're talking rape from young boys who are now grown men and women who want to come forward but the culture across the systems of safeguard in there in trying to get them to have this conversation and hear these people it, it, i never what what is this about you know okay this is historical uh, abuse with these individuals have finally found the courage to come forward to talk about what they describe as their shame because that's how they see it and it's turned on its head it's now the church's shame now somebody like me you know, who comes across this, and there were 12 individuals that I was building cases for, you know, could see what was happening. And what was happening actually was the church don't want to have this conversation. <laughs> That's what's happening here. Building these cases and building these cases. And it's very clear what needs to be done to help these people, to enable them to move on with their lives. But the blocks were many. The blocks were so many. I mean, I, I will say the church have apologised for how even we were treated for bringing the conversation to the table. But these individuals, these survivors of clergy abuse, are still in that place. You know, they, they, their cases have not been reviewed. They haven't moved on, etc. You know, and what I'm saying is, if you don't have those open and transparent, transparent conversations, Shame will keep manifesting itself institutionally, culturally. <clears throat> and then you've got a bigger problem because the people who want to do the right thing are going to come up against that. And what normally happens is they end up leaving. They end up leaving and then another person comes and the institution continues to behave in that way. And those people who are good willing that want to have those moral conversations, want to change things, get stifled and think, we can't stay here anymore. We're going somewhere else. 
So you see this overtone of staff, good people, because the institution is not willing to change. No, that's absolutely right. And I mean, I think with the, the, the point that you're making and what, what I want to really emphasize is that when we have compassion, it's courage and wisdom, right? You know, there's a lot of stuff on compassion now about it's all about kindness and love and all that stuff. And I'm not against something as wonderful, but that's not the, the real root of compassion is to stand against the causes of suffering. And that's courage and wisdom. You don't need to love people to do that. You need to have courage and the conviction of pursuing the values that you're talking about, but to stop the causing of harm. And I think if we could really get people to understand that's what compassion is about. It's not about this other stuff that goes on. The middle classes like to talk about, oh, be kind to all that stuff. It's really this, this that, that's why I see you as a real beacon of compassion and why I'm delighted you've come on to com creating a compassionate world because you demonstrated very clearly courage and wisdom at addressing suffering. And you've been prepared to put up with a hell of a lot to pursue that value in terms of leaving the family and all the stuff that's been thrown at you over the years. So I think you have an absolute brilliant way of bringing compassion to shame. Well, you know, we, we, we cannot heal what we cannot feel. You know, we have to feel it first, you know. Yeah. So and then otherwise it, it becomes, it, you know, you're not. War I mean, I don't think empathy is an overrated word. You know, it's actually an underrated one. You know, you have to feel it. I feel it. You know, and 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 not just that. It means I do a lot of things in terms of putting my nose where it's not meant to be. Actually, sometimes because it matters. Yeah, yeah. You know, and in a voluntary capacity, John, my partner, will say, "Darling, not another cause." Well, actually, you know, it does matter. You know, if if you don't start it, and especially. If you are a person that has influence or a position of responsibility, use it for that purpose. That's what that's what it's there for. You know, I think that the worst, the worst discompassionate people are those who have a position of authority and power and they don't use it for good. I think that's such an important point, you know, and they you know, if you met them, you've seen they're perfectly pleasant, kind people. Absolutely. Yeah. But they're not able to use their their power to address suffering that's an issue i think you're absolutely right about that that's an issue and you're also making a very important point about compassionate leadership yeah i mean yeah. one of the things we lack in the world today is compassionate leadership the leadership is you know in this country and other places is really all about managing economics it's not about uh, addressing the suffering inherent within our communities the poverty the running down the health service all that stuff um, so again, the point that you're making is an incredibly important one, is you have to have this courage and wisdom to address suffering, because otherwise everything else is just, you know, nice frills around the edges, isn't it? Really? And to be persistent, you know, you know, the, the number of doors that have closed in my face <laughs> over the years, you know, nobody gave us a criminal offence of forced marriage, the government didn't give us that. We had to knock on so many doors and mm -hmm. talk to so many people and have so many doors closed in our face to get them to even listen and feel what victims in this space feel. You know, so being persistent is really important with it, you know, because it's really easy as, as human beings to think, okay, that fight's done, that's never going to happen. Well, actually, if we, if we think like that, you know, my, my 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 motto is, and I read this quote, it says, don't don't believe the sky is the limit because there are footprints on the moon. <laughs> so <laughs> you've got to have uh, that that optimism about it. Yeah. You know, if not now, when it will happen. But you've got to be a like-minded people. There's so many compassionate people out there that actually want to come into this space. But it's helping them and enabling them to find the courage to be part of that. That's, exactly. that space. that's the thing. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly. And that's why you're such a shining beacon of how to do that. And also that we can cope with the rejections and the pushbacks. We can if we hold on to this value and we hold on to the fact that what you've been saying is that there are many people who are moving the world to a compassionate places, even though it's a very dark place in many ways. There are also many people who are 
like you beginning to stand up against injustice, stand up against suffering. I mean, so as we're moving on a little bit now, so what do you see to, of the challenges and what are you wanting to achieve for the years ahead for you? Because you've achieved so much, but I mean, what, what are you looking to do and what are challenging you at the moment? Well, um, I, I, I will say to anybody listening is you, you really have to hold on to that core value that you are worthy. You know, when you've been rejected, I mean, rejection has been part of my life. The fear of rejection, the, you know, the, the triggers that can happen in that space for you, it's really important to remain sane and to take care of yourself. That's really important. You know, that, that if you didn't have that, you couldn't keep on going. That's the important thing. From my perspective, Paul, and in fact, I'd love to talk to you about this. Um, um, I am really interested in wanting to um, speak with women who have murdered their children in the name of so-called honour. I think we really have to understand their, their motivations, their struggle. You know, people say to me, how can a mother kill her own daughter, Jasmine? Well, there's no, there's no right answer to that question in terms of me being able to respond to that. We need deeper understanding in terms of how this power holds on to them for them to be driven to harm the very people, you know, they carried for nine months. So I'd like to get close to doing that. I'm actually exploring how I am able to do that across the prison service at the moment. So I'm exploring that right now because that understanding, that wisdom, is really going to help us to be more compassionate, but more importantly, to offer the right support to those individuals in order to shift their thinking. I wish, you know, I, I believe my mother was a compassionate being. I believe my mother did the things she did because of the way she was raised, you know, and she saw no other way. So I want to understand that. I want to understand the whys and the how and the, what would have changed mum, you know, what would have helped? And and that's what we need to come back because these individuals will come back into the community and keep doing the same thing. These individuals who have not yet murdered, not yet harmed, exist in our communities. And I believe they are searching for something in terms of change and wanting to change that. Because one of the things I saw with the criminalization of forced marriage was that what Carmen Levane tells me, of course, I left the charity after 25 years, is that creating law doesn't change people. You know, the law is not a panacea, but what they're finding is that more victims are being able to talk to their parents now and negotiate this space because you don't want to go to prison, mum and dad. You know, it's a criminal offence. They're able to have these conversations and that is shifting something. So that is something I'm really interested in. And I'm writing my fourth book at the moment right now. And... Um, one of the things that I'm looking back on is when I left the charity, Paul, I I um actually had not acknowledged myself as having a traumatic event when I left home. Trauma wasn't a word that I was part of me, you know. And all of a sudden, because I was no longer in this space of constantly doing with the charity, it's not anybody who's a founder of a charity. Well, no, it's not nine to five. It becomes part of you. My children used to say, there's not three children, there's four. The fourth is Carmen Nirvana. Processing what actually happened to me and processing and understanding it more has taken the last 18 months of my life. It, it, I should have done it a long time ago. Because as we know, overworking is, can be a trauma response as well. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking back with hindsight. And what I really would like to give the world is some of my understanding in terms of how I've um, been able to still hold on to a moral courage and a sense of self-worth and a sense of purpose as somebody who, if you think about it, that left home at 16, I didn't read a book until I was 28, I'm disowned and rejected by my family, could have been somebody that was a very different person. <laughs> you know, the stakes, the odds were against me. But I'm 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 here and I'm surviving and I'm so pleased that I am. But how have I done that? Well, 
I've got a lot of things I want to share with the world in terms of that space in the hope that it will also speak to them. That's that's my hope. <laughs> I think the, the question you're asking about how mothers can kill their babies, we have many contacts in the prisons and we can put you in contact with that. But I mean, there are lots, you see, the human mind is made up of multiple components and these components can become dissociated from each other. We know, for example, in the case of vengeance, vengeance turns off empathy. It turns, well, it turns it off to the extent that rather than uh, being concerned about causing harm, you want to cause harm. Vengeance is actually you want to cause harm. And if you look at what's going on in various parts of the world, we won't name them. I mean, it's all vengeance and it just turns off empathy. Both sides have no interest or very little interest in the harm that they're causing each other. It's a it's a huge tragedy for humans. So we know that there are systems in our brains that turn off compassion, they turn off empathy, and they then allow us to do the most hideous things. Humans are one of the most vicious, nasty species that have ever existed, right? And uh, killing one's child is an example of that. Um, I can put you in touch with somebody who actually does research in that, in fact. Um, so <clears throat> these are very, very important questions. And we have to understand that humans can be very compassionate, but only if you create the conditions and only if you actually have the values for it. Because if you don't, then you end up like the Romans or the Nazis or whatever. Um, so how we create compassion cultures, how we create compassion cult context, you know, how we get more people like you standing up and saying, look, you know, let's actually use our courage and wisdom to stand against suffering. Humans can be very nasty. Uh, history shows that tragically um but we don't have to be like that because we also have this other part of us um you know it's the old star wars and it beware the power of the dark side luke um so we've got to be very careful with that so understanding how our brains in certain contexts turn yeah. off the compassion systems that it, it turns off the empathy system so once they're turned once they're turned off then you can do all kinds of horrible things yeah. um, and you know, understanding how that happens with with women is really really important you know I, I and also the fact that when i reflect and um disagreeing is healthy yeah. i've sat around tables where 90 percent of the time people disagree with what i had to say you know in the early days of campaigning and i've shifted from wanting to scream and shout to actually hearing them truly hearing them because actually their lack of understanding is an opportunity to put compassion into the room and that space yes. i've learned that yes. that is such a big thing i've learned over the years and it, it's okay to say to me um is that what your family do they, they force you into marriages because it's your religion rather than go what i go but actually let me explain <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, so you know, it, it is healthy to disagree and to sit amongst people that do not share your values and your purpose, because there lies an opportunity to bring compassion into the space and to have that conversation about fear. What is the fear here? <laughs> yes. yes, and the right, and you you always come back to this: the fear of being shamed, the fear of being nothing, the fear of being marginalised, the fear of being inferiorized and being yeah. made to feel stupid or whatever it is so i think that all of that yeah. is important and the point that you made earlier on as well is that when you get engaged with some of these individuals uh, you find that actually there are, there's a lot of unprocessed trauma in people you know capitalism produces a lot of trauma in lots of different ways uh yes. not <laughs> within families and within different so trauma when you have traumatized people who are not aware that they've been traumatized they become defensive very easily very quickly because that's what trauma does it, it, it sensitizes your threat system and anything that looks like it's going to threaten to them up go the barriers and you can see it very quickly when you're talking to people you realize you touched a spot for them and probably what's sitting behind that is a lot of unprocessed pain so what you're talking about is extremely important is how do you have conversations with people who can be quite fragile in certain areas and they're they're not really listening to the conversation actually they're in the process of defending themselves uh, yeah. that they're not actually paying attention to the information so having those conversations and being able to not push too hard so that you constantly stimulate the threat how do you 
how do you help them to feel safe enough to relax that threat system so they can start to listen? That's a skill, though, to spin to. That is a skill, and it's difficult, you know, because we, <laughs> when we have disagreements, we get head to head, you know. Um, so especially that's a very young, important thing. Especially with young people, and there are many young people out there in that space yeah. who are, you know, traumatized people, young yeah, people, traumatized. You know, with all the pressures as well that people are facing. Um, the point that you made is that, you know, first of all, facial expressions, friendly face, right? Oh, mm. that's very interesting. Okay, can you explain to me a little bit about how that is for you? And so the mm. first movement for empathy is to move towards the other, as opposed to, well, you shut up. I want to tell you about me. The first movement of empathy is to move towards the other in a friendly way. And Absolutely. I think that if you could get that one skill across to people, that would be terrific. Yeah. Well, I certainly am going to um, explore this more and more in terms of I, I, I'm guilty of not um, using the word compassion and empathy more and more. I'm doing it, but I, but I, but I need to be able to speak to it more for people to hear that, for them to understand that more, because many people... Um, need to think about the word and then to implement the word and what does that actually mean in terms of people's lives and and campaigning and change and etc so i need to voice that more also i believe i've carried it out i mean i it, i i never forget over the 25 years of um conferences and speaking and the first thing i would always do at any conference once i published shame was i'd get my book this is not for sales by the way and I'd read the two significant events in my life from my book because I wanted people to feel how I felt as that 16-year-old in the payphone when my mother said, you either come back or you're dead in our eyes. And the room, the room would just go quiet. You could hear a pin drop because they were feeling yeah. what I was feeling in that moment. And then I'd read the bit about when my sister Rabina committed suicide. And as soon as you place that, plant that in the room, and they feel that everything changes Yeah. in their head. They're thinking, gosh, this is real. And then they start to think, I used to have a friend at school that disappeared. And then the, the brain starts thinking towards what you're feeling. And yeah. that's what shifts, shifts things when you have the conversation. And they feel comfortable enough to have that conversation. They feel safe to have that that's conversation. Right. The feeling of safeness is so important. And the other thing that we do with empathy is, always if that were me so wherever whatever you know if you, you can think of some horrible places in the world right now you know if that was my children being blown up if that was my partner being raped if that was yeah. me yeah. being taught if that were me if that was me if that was me that allows us then to begin to open up the awareness of the suffering around us but people close that down because it can be overwhelming you know to think about well to look at my kids and to think about well, supposing I was in Gaza and I saw them blown up or I saw them have their legs blown off, if that were me, that's a see yeah. asking people to take that journey if that were me is quite painful and and people close it down. They don't want to know. So again, empathy requires the courage to pay attention to the suffering. Uh it's so so important. So important. Uh, yeah. That. Which is why when when I open mm -hmm. that door, I give them the tools to go away and do something to change this space <laughs> you know that's really important because when you open that door of suffering this is how it was for me yeah this is my journey but now you can go away and educate people and talk about this and that and they really are receptive to that that's right because they felt what you felt and they want to do something to that's change right. that's right <laughs> and getting them to say so imagine that was you it's not yes. imagine that yes. was you right yes. supposing you this was you how would you be? so i think that's so anyway that what is what are you so you're planning to look at the mothers who kill their children uh, what else have you got on your agenda well um apart from writing the fourth book um, is there a focus for that book are you going to focus that book yeah i'm going to in fact um share uh how i've processed and strategized in order to be a sane human being that's moved on from rejection uh, i want people to think about 
you know, the journey beyond the the victim of a forced marriage. You know, I I I am more than being a survivor of a forced marriage. You know, oh my I'm, goodness me, absolutely. I, I want to talk about the, the the importance of future generations as well. So I'm kind of looking back with the wisdom and the understanding I have today. Well, I couldn't, I used to stand up and I used to say, um, when I shared in my journey, you know, my mother was the key perpetrator in my life. I used to say that. I'm not saying that anymore. I don't want to say that anymore and that's a huge shift in me in terms of understanding because I've really had to strip myself of the hurt and the anger and the the things I've felt at the loss not just for me but for my children in order to understand her mm. and I and that is so important to me I just I'm sorry we've never had that conversation with my mom you know and it's interesting because Secretly, my mother and father used to meet me, you know, without without full view of the family. When my father died, you know, uh, uh, he 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 made me an executor of his will, but it, publicly he couldn't tell people. Wow. He was talking to me, you know, wow. and in the corner of his bedroom there was a picture. If you weren't looking, you'd miss it, and it was my graduation picture. Wow. You know, so secretly, you know, it's so sad that he had to hold this in because he would have been shamed by his community. These, these individuals allow this to happen also. Mm. So we need to understand that because people are prisoners within that and spectators to it, aren't they? Yes. I think that's such a wonderful point you made that we need to understand the fear of rejection, the fear of aloneness. Yeah. Uh, at the heart of hum the human mind is the fear of aloneness, you know, whether you think about it from the spiritual point of view, you know, when people imagine the next life they never imagine just being by themselves somewhere it's always about being connected in a loving way somehow um yeah. so this issue of aloneness is is it, it drives so much of our harmfulness in in many ways so so you're going to be focusing on those sorts of things and um you're going to be thinking talking more about compassion the courage of compassion because you, <laughs> you 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 uh, it <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i am and um you know i obviously have just had the news of being knighted so you know these 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 awards are platforms for greater good that's what they are um i and i really want to see where this takes me in terms of the things that i want to do to put back into society compassion empathy understanding and um, I, I there's, there's, where do you start? There is so much pain and suffering. Yeah. The, the grandparents campaign is a campaign I joined two and a half years ago. These are grandparents who um, their children have stopped them completely from seeing their grandchildren because of disagreements within the family. It is so sad. You know, the, the last time I looked at it was two million. You think about grandchildren. The, how that how many numbers that translates in children not seeing their grandparents who are critical people in their lives that the ramifications on individuals and society are huge you know why is this happening so from my perspective these are conversations that we need to have because ultimately the price will be paid with younger generations as they get older yes very much so and i i uh, that's so important one last point that you've been making is this point about transpersonal or the sort of common humanity the depersonalizing of it is i mean it is personal because it's your parents but on the other hand humans have been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years right this is something that humans do uh, yeah. not specifically directed at you it's yeah. what happens right so the more we can stand out of that process and realize that everybody's caught up in it you know nobody chose it nobody sat down they are oh, i'll be like this today um we're just caught up in it and because of the way our brains are we just act out the cultural scripts unless we have people like yourself for example who can stand outside of that and kind of pull us in in, in a different direction yeah. um dame to spinder <laughs> it's fantastic talking to you lovely talking to you we'll have more conversations uh, later you. you're coming to talk at our conference um, 
October. Again, this is a conference on compassion for the harmfulness of the human mind. But it's been an absolute delight talking with you. And I, as I say, I think you are absolutely epitomize all the best e examples of, of compassion courage, really. Absolutely wonderful. And it's been a delight knowing you and all the work you've done. So thank you so much for coming and talking about how to create a compassionate world. Thank you, Paul.